Before we get into today's video, I want to tell a short story. This is the story of the original Microsoft BASIC, written for the famous Altair 8800 computer. This is the first product of Microsoft, and it is so important that allegedly the company shared between Paul Allen and Bill Gates is split depending on how much they wrote the original BASIC. However, this version of BASIC was famously not written on Altair, but on a PDP-10 using a cross-assembler. And as the legend goes, neither of the original authors have seen an 8080 before they actually tested the program on Altair. It is said that Paul Allen was the first to test BASIC on Altair by typing print 2 plus 2 on the terminal, and the machine outputs 4. It's such a simple operation, but so many things have to work exactly as they should to make that 4 appear out of the terminal. First of all, the machine has to work. The Altair 8800 was a nice little machine, but it wasn't known as the most reliable computer in the world. Second, the basic has to parse the print instruction correctly, and that depends on both the tokenizer and the interpreter. And third, the math has to work, because all math done in Microsoft BASIC was done in floating point, so the 2 plus 2 has to be converted to floating point operations first, and then added and converted back to integer to be output. For years, I have wondered what Bill Gates and Paul Allen felt when they saw the 4 appear on the terminal screen. And I think I finally know it. When I saw that little green light blissfully blinking away on my new motherboard for the HEC project. But to understand all of that, let's rewind and start from the beginning. Okay, cut. I originally wanted to make this a super like inspirational video about how I did the sketchmatic and placing of components and routing and all that stuff. Um, but I realized that would take too much time to make a chronological documentary, and I've got a tripod coming up. Yeah, I don't want to take the worst way out of my education, let's just say that. So, I'll be brief. This has been such a journey, and probably because this is actually my first PCB project. This is like my first self-designed PCB. And that's why in my last video I called out for help from the community. However, I'm no 8-bit guy. I'm no Adrian's digital basement. I'm not any of them and I just don't have enough influence in the community. So I had to do everything myself. So I learned how to route a PCB and that actually involves a co-design between the PCB and the Sketchmatic. And if you want to see my process of learning how to route a PCB and gradually getting better at it, you can watch my live streams. When I designed the PCB, I set myself three rules. And the first is use a two-layer board, and that's not to just cut cost. And that's because I don't know how good this circuit is. None of that has been proven anywhere. I've double checked and triple checked with data sheets and timing diagrams and everything, but there's no guarantee that any part of that would work. And I thought in the worst case scenario, I can just cut the power to a section of the board and just disable it entirely. Think about that. I can just not populate that part of the board if it turns out to be problematic. Second is I want this board to be fully MATX compliant. However, as you can see, this is actually not an MATX board. If you overlay this on a true MATX motherboard, for example, an X16, which is not a very good example of an MATX motherboard, but you'll see the actual MATX is like this much bigger than this. But I'm a fool. And I thought if I can cram all the chips on this PCB, I can route them. 
which turns out to be a nightmare because of my third constraint, which is I want this board to be manufacturable in the 80s. This is a bit surprising, but the PCB manufacturing process has also advanced since the 1980s. It has not advanced so much like the silicon chips themselves, but modern manufacturers can do a lot more than the PCB manufacturers of the 1980s. So I took the motherboard of my PC88, my PC8801 to be precise, and I measured it. And it turns out that motherboard used a process that can route precisely five traces between a 0.1 inch gap. So I used that as a blueprint and tweaked a little bit to allow me to put two routes between adjacent paths, which the PC8801 motherboard also did. Long story short, these constraints gave me a lot of trouble, but I pushed through and the PCB design was complete. I ordered the PCB from JLC PCB, not the sponsor, but I do find them to be a little bit cheaper than PCB way. I guess just because they don't have to pay for like a thousand YouTube sponsorships. So they are able to run their business a bit more efficiently. While I waited for my PCB to arrive, I played around with my Atari 800XL a little bit and found out that you can actually read a Nintendo controller on Atari without any modding. I will do a video on that, so subscribe if you want to see that. Okay, self-promotion done. <laughs> Let's move back to the PCB. It arrived, and the parts arrived. I sorted them on and realized I don't have a test code for that. Well, no big problem. I hopped on VS Code and wrote a super tiny program that would do something. And the next problem is that I don't have a clock crystal, which is not very problematic because I've always intended to use this Arduino board to supply the, the clock. And if necessary, it will also allow me to monitor some of the signals using the Arduino. So I literally just loaded up the Blink demo program from the Arduino library and tweaked the timing a little bit to output a, like a 5 hertz signal. And I saw something on the M1 ping of the Z80, which signifies the Z80 is running code. I'm quite surprised, but that's all I can confirm at that point because my debugging circuitry relied on a seven segment LED display to work. However, then I realized that a seven segment LED display is just seven displays and my motherboard have already got everything that's needed to drive an LED, even the current limiting resistors. So I can just hook up this little thing, which is just LED on one side and DuPont cables on the other, to the 7 second display socket, or just the holes on the motherboard, and get a result. So I did exactly that, and the LED wasn't blinking. I spent half an hour debugging this, and it turns out the problem is that I designed my decoder circuit, the 7 segment decoder circuit, with the DM9368 in mind. And there's a subtle difference between that chip and the 74LS47, that's the more common one, and that's the one I'm using. It is the LT and the LE pin on the two chips respectively serves different purposes. Although their name is super close that I just completely missed it. The LE stands for latch enable, which needs to be low for the chip to operate. 
but the LT actually stands for lamp test. And pulling that pin low will just light up all the LEDs. But that's no problem, that's exactly why I insisted on a two-layer motherboard. That's because I can cut the pull up and pull downs, which I cannot do if the power are in the inner layers of the PCB. So I cut the traces and voila! It just works. So what's next for this project? Well, I have put the board on Tindy so that you can purchase it for 30 pounds. Or you can purchase a semi-kit version that includes some of the more rare parts for 50 pounds. I would actually recommend getting the semi-kit version because some of those parts have to come from AliExpress and the shipping time is super long. I'm actually still waiting for some of those parts to arrive. I also want to sell a fully kitted version, which will go for maybe 80 to 100 pounds or maybe 100 dollars. But the difference is mostly just chips and sockets. So I don't know how much interest people will have in that version. So if we want to see a full kit version of this motherboard, please leave a comment in the comment section below. And finally, know that this is a very much a prototype version of this motherboard. And as I have mentioned, you need to cut two traces under these two chips. Ideally, before you even solder the sockets, I tried, I can't do it after I put the sockets in, but it's hard. Or you can use the DM9368, which will give you hexadecimal output. And second is that I forgot to put in power on reset on this board. So when you power it on, you need to hold down the reset button. But you can always add your own circuits, like reset circuit, on the prototyping regions here or here or here. And that's why this board is a prototype. It's meant to iron out these bugs. And to be honest with you, I would not sell this batch of the board if I had a choice. Um, it's just such an early stage. However, despite common misconceptions or stereotypes, Although I live and study in one of the most prestigious universities in the world, I'm not the son of some business tycoons or government officials or some very rich person. And I've spent over a thousand pounds not counting my labor into this project. So if you would like to support this project, you can go to the Tindy store in the link in the description below or you can check out my patreon and if you want to know more about this project you can join our discord we have many great people there and they make great suggestions about the design of this project so if you want to get involved you can check out our discord in the link also in the description below but that's it for this video big thanks go out to my patreons and i'm andy I will see you in the next one. Bye. Don't have enough inf interference. <laughs>